Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to Lost Voice Radio, where we seek to resurrect that old ancient wisdom of Socrates, the uh, voice of wisdom that spoke to him over 2,000 years ago. I think we actually got the map on it uh, one time. Dr. Dr. Mafud wrote to us, and, and we got him. We were, and I'm a theologian, and uh, I'm a theologian, a philosopher, so I've, I've always had a problem with numbers. You know, Trinity, three is one, one is three, one is two at the same time, but then my, my principal struggle with, uh, with my philosophical undertaking and my philosophical uh, inquiries has tends to be with what the one of the many, and so I have just really abandoned the idea of math. Uh, and what I'm really happy about that joke today, I'm really happy about it, uh, because although they didn't laugh, because they're being polite and waiting for me to introduce them, my two guests are among the very few people on this planet, who could possibly see any humor in that horrible, horrible joke I have. <laughs> um, and of course, I am speaking of none other, you guys already know this, um, none other than uh, my occasional guest host, uh, Christopher Apodaca, Professor Christopher Apodaca, give him his full fancy title to make, to make him feel important. And of course, uh, we have on our line today, uh, one of my uh, newest professors of Holy Apostles, uh, that's Dr. Robert Anthony Delfino, who has recently uh, written a co-authored book with, what was, was Matt Fred, right? Yeah, Matt Fred, uh, right. entitled uh, Does God Exist?, which is a Socratic dialogue on Thomas's five ways. Um, and today we're uh, going to be making a link to that on uh, the Facebook page that I have, um, and uh, we'll also be uh, posting something on the WCAT Radio website as well. Uh, so that you guys can access that. And we'll be talking about his book today, but I also want to let everyone know that if you're listening, we are open to any calls that you might have regarding St. Thomas's five ways or anything that has to do with his uh, natural theology or the philosophy of God uh, taught by St. Thomas Aquinas, divine attributes, um, knowledge of uh, uh, future contingents, uh, middle knowledge, uh, anything you can think of. We want to talk about divine simplicity and personal uh, the, uh, personal theism, uh, sorry, theistic personalism, we're more than welcome to uh, field your calls. Um, and you can give us a call at uh, 515-604-9344 with the access code of 914-121, followed by the hashtag or the pound symbol, depending on what generation you come from. And the phone number is 515-604-9344 with the access code of 914-121, followed by the pound sign. All right. Well, before we get started on the meat and potatoes of our show, uh, we do unfortunately have about 10 minutes, or fortunately, uh, have about 10 minutes of the uh, of obligatory nonsense to get through before we can talk about something more substantial, which is totally the truth if you guys have ever listened to our show before. And I know that both you and uh, both uh, Dr. Delfino and Chris are uh, huge fans of our show. In fact, um, even uh, when, when, Delfino, when Dr. Delfino published his book, he sent me a copy. And uh, the reason why he sent me a copy wasn't, you know, to say, hey, John, could you review this book or what you think? Um, but rather, he was actu- actually asking for my autograph, saying that <laughs> <You're> I, <crazy. laughs> appreciate, uh, I appreciate and approve of what he's written because he, he admires the show so much. I'm, I'm basically uh, the, uh, his, uh, the person he strives to be like. <laughs> Well, I'm, gl- I'm glad you got over that. Uh, of all the philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you've successfully got over that drinking problem you had, Jonathan. It's really yeah. good to hear that. You know? <laughs> I wouldn't call it a success or a problem. Um, uh, you know, Jonathan, we're all sitting here waiting with bated breath for your approval. So, I mean, that's fantastic that you did that for Dr. Delfino. I, I, I know, I know. And, and I did send him back a copy of uh, not only my signature, but I also gave him a, uh, a more recent photograph of myself as well. Um, it was a good side, too. Um, the side <laughs> that you can't really see. So that way, it, I gave him my radio voice. Uh, my radio face, I should say. And he's doing just fine. But, uh, Dr. Delfino, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think so. I mean, he, he hasn't... Uh, he he's been, seems a lot more happy recently, you know? Um, <laughs> but Dr. Delfino... Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. I, I think this is the second time I've had a 
live conversation with you. We've had a couple of email exchanges in reality. Um, uh, Dr. Delfino did not send me a copy of his book, um, uh, although I did buy one. So you know, there's that. Um, and it was excellent. And we'll be talking about that just a moment here. But for our listeners, uh, why don't you just tell us a little about yourself? Uh, you know, who you are, uh, what your education is, and what you do in your in your spare time. And uh, perhaps you can tell us um, uh, what's your favorite kind of tree. Tree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, first, let me thank uh, both of you uh, for having me on. I know this is. Uh, Jonathan's uh, show, and uh, Chris sometimes appears, but uh, both of you are good guys, or at least so I thought before the uh, previous monologue. Uh, we have him deceived. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm an associate professor of philosophy at St. John's University in uh, New York City. But prior to that, I was part of a secret government genetic project that didn't really pan out. Now, that's a joke. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I got a chance to... I have a PhD in philosophy, obviously, and I, I got a chance to study under a great medievalist who also told me that Thomas Aquinas is his favorite. This is none other than Jorge Gracia, a fantastic uh, philosopher and past president of the American Catholic Philosophical Association. So he was great to study under, and don't worry, I won't bore you guys to death. The other professor who had a profound impact on me was Dr. Peter Redpath, who I think you guys know, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He's fantastic. I had a few conversations with him. He was a good guy. The, yeah, of Red Pass is amazing. He, he pumps out books every, like, six months, and they're, like, 500 pages. I'll, I'll never be that good, but I do enjoy yeah. reading his stuff. No kidding. Oh, yeah, I, I do, too. Especially uh, the first time I read him, I heard to say this publicly, it's like, oh, God, man, this guy's crazy. But then the more I learned about my uh, <laughs> metaphysics, I started realizing, wait, no, he's crazy like a fox. This guy's a genius. The way he just <laughs> phrases and, 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 and interprets St. Thomas's or expresses St. Thomas's uh, uh, metaphysical system makes so much sense, and it made everything so much clearer for me. But the big thing was when he talked about form as an intrinsic principle of eternal of, uh, of, uh, of unity. Organization. Um, what was that? Organization. Well, well it's, it's both, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unity, yeah, but it's organizational. Right, right. Yeah, or organizational. Yeah, yeah organizational uh, unity. Um, that made so much more sense to me, and I, I ceased being a platonist at that moment. Because it made sense that it wasn't simply, it wasn't like two things that came together like a symbol on two halves of a uh, medallion, but rather that it was uh, a, a principle, some, some source of operation within the thing that is identical with the thing itself, or that's, uh, I should say, uh, um, that is the thing itself. Um, matter and the form, they're not two things, they're it's one, substantial unity that made so much sense to me. It was a breakthrough moment. But anyway, so Dr. Delfino, you could go ahead. Um, you don't need to know about me and my, my past feelings as a Thomas. Well, I mean, the only other big thing, I, I mean, I specialize in, um, in metaphysics, and when I was in grad school, I, I took Latin because the kind of metaphysics I like is obviously the metaphysics of Thomas Aquinas. So uh, medieval philosophy is also a kind of love of mine. Um, but the big thing, I guess, recently that I've done is uh, I wrote that book with Matt Fred that you mentioned on the five ways, and uh, and that was uh, it was an enjoyable experience, but it was a lot of work too. How'd that come about, by the way? How'd you get to uh, run into Mr. Fred? Oh yeah, all right. I'll, I'll give you guys the the quick version of the story. So, as you know, Matt Fred also took co- courses at Holy Apostles, right? And, yeah, he did. Uh, I, he did. I actually I got to be his instructor at one point. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, so apparently, I, I don't know, maybe around two years ago, I, I don't know the exact timeline, but he uh, was thinking about a book on the five ways, and eventually he submitted a draft to uh, Dr. Mafood, and Mafood passed it my way because he knows I do a lot of stuff with Thomas and, and uh, metaphysics and all that. He wanted to, me to look at it, see if it was done well, and there, were, there was a lot of things I liked in it, although I thought... Um, some of the ways he explained the five ways could be improved a bit, so I started giving him some suggestions. And before you know it, Matt, you know, to his credit, very nicely said, Robert, why don't you jump on board and we'll write this book together. We'll revise it and all that kind of stuff. So I said, all right, great. And uh, from that moment on, I, I kept working with him, and we kept adding stuff and changing things. And lo and behold, the version that you have in your hand is the result. Well, it's fantastic. Um, I think that uh, Matt Fratt, I've been listening to him for a while now. He's probably one of my favorite uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite cop podcasts, not even just Catholic cop podcasts, but podcasts in general, and it's because he's so clearly expressed from a mystic point of view. And I, I didn't even know he had a master's degree in philosophy from Holy Apostles or at all. Um, yeah. Well, you just mentioned it, which explains why he's so uh, uh, so well versed in it. I mean, it's sometimes you hear somebody uh, or like a uh, a layman 
speak at length on these things and, and thinking to yourself, well, he doesn't have any formal education. Man, he's so much better than I am. And he, he still is so much better than I am. But it makes a lot more sense for how, uh, how systematic and order, uh, orderly he is with his philosophical acumen um, and his expression of St. Thomas's ideas that he actually has that master's degree in philosophy and holy apostles, which I've, you know, as, a, as somebody who's um, a little bit more than halfway through the program, I've been you know, largely impressed with the quality of students that come out of holy apostles. Um, uh, compared to even some of the previous online education, uh, online education that I've, I've done or that I've seen in the past, um, um, I think a huge part of that is because of the of professors like um, Robert, uh, Dr. Delfino, and actually Christopher Apodaca here. I've had the honor of being a TA for three or four classes now. And um, well, I have to uh, say, Jonathan, we are very good. You are. You are very good. Wow, this, this is a Thomistic love fest going on here, yeah. man. <laughs> it is. Well, you know, we're all, you know, we, we, I mean, I'm a youth minister, you guys are professors, and your Tom is professors at that. Um, none of you are on the uh, on our, our administration. Now, wait a minute. Uh, Jonathan, aren't you uh, doing some teaching? Didn't you tell me that you're teaching somewhere? Yeah, I teach at the Dominican yep. Institute. Um, it's an online uh, program. It's going to be a startup school uh, that was uh, sort of similar to Holy Apostles, except the idea is... Um, to give uh, uh, a, 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 an, upper, an upper undergraduate or a lower level undergraduate uh, or lower low, low level graduate uh, courses um, to the general population um, for a very inexpensive price. The uh, price of a 15 week course is $150, um, which is 10% of the average right now, whereas most uh, most Catholic most uh, online uh, Catholic institutions offering theology or philosophy um, tend to be around fifteen hundred to um, two thousand um, dollars. Right. Hey, does uh, mm-hmm. Father Thomas Joseph White have anything to do with that uh, online teaching thing? Thomas Joseph White. He, no, he he does something though. He does. Um, oh, where is it? Uh, it's like I think it's the Dominican man. Oh, and let me, it's, it's called the Thomistic Institute, actually. There we go. Um, yeah, the Thomistic yeah, Institute. Yeah, actually, I actually was... Uh, Inter- I had International the great honor of, Institute. Yeah, I had the great honor of seeing one of his lectures that's related to the Thomistic Institute. And then I had the even greater honor of being able to go out to dinner with him afterwards and, and pick his brain a little bit. So that was fantastic. Wow. That's yeah. great. No, it's yeah, nice. it Actually, cool. I had dinner with him once, too. Um, I'm hoping one day to have the, even the greater honor of having vodka with him, but we'll see how that works out. <laughs> yeah, it was just wine that night, so... <laughs> <laughs> Hey, wine is good. Anything uh, again? Doctor Delfino and I were talking about how uh, uh, at, at, when you have alcohol, the best theology happens. I mean, the Last Supper had wine, and can you think of any better theology that goes on in Christ's offering his very body? So, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty much right there in the black and white, or you know, red, red and white, if you want to go with Christ's words. That if we're going to be doing theology and philosophy and talking about reality at the deepest level, we should probably be drinking some alcohol. Well, well I don't know about you guys, but I, I drink because I'm married. I'm only kidding. All right. So yeah. what do you? <laughs> I think by that because I have kids. I remember there was one time my kids were just absolutely losing their minds. My wife, um, as I'm putting my son to sleep, my wife comes in and she uh, she hands me a shot uh, hands me a shot of soju, which is a, a Korean rice rice wine. I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I was gonna say I didn't know what that is. <laughs> Korean rice wine. That's cool. Yeah, it uh, it, it it hits you like gasoline. It's crazy. Um, but uh, uh there's really good uh, versions of it when they when it's like when they have the the plum flavor. Um. Very smooth, uh, so that would definitely sneak stuff on you. Gotta be careful with that. I like a Long Island iced tea. I remember one time I had a Long Island iced tea and had maybe like an inch of it, and then I couldn't drive. Uh, and I see stripping because well, I'm also lightweight too, so I'll have like a beer and I'm practically tipsy. Um, and then I get really ridiculous because if you don't think I have, if you think I've been ambitious now, or don't think I've been ambitious now, you should see me. You know, after like looking at a pint of. Long, of uh, so <laughs> speaking of Jonathan's <laughs> drinking problem, so bad. No, I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> problem, meaning I don't get it enough. Nah. <laughs> Isn't that the married life? All right, so I have a, I have a thing. I'm going to take this in a little new, unexpected direction, if that's all right. So I, I think uh, we, we were hoping that we're going to get some calls from uh, agnostics and atheists. But just, let, me, let me play the role of the atheist and see how you guys answer this question. How about oh, that? Great. Oh, great. Oh, man, he's okay. coming after his students now. Okay, professor. Now, no, I'm not coming <laughs> after you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, one of the um, criticisms I often hear, and there's some merit to it uh, in the sense that I think it, it, it needs a, uh, a good response. You know, it shouldn't just be dismissed or avoided. One of the uh, criticisms I hear is, like, some people say, what would it take to falsify or at least get you to seriously question belief in God? Now, I'll pose that to either of you, and then I'll tell you what it would take for me. Uh, so whoever wants to be the first taker, go for it. 
Okay, I'll do it. I'll, let me throw something out there. So I think, uh, so two things. Um, the problem with, with that question is, is how am I going to approach it as a Catholic and how am I going to approach it as a, uh, as a philosopher? Um, so as a Catholic, um, you know, I believe in the divine gift of faith and so on and so forth. I think for me, the only way to falsify the existence of God for me would be is if you could show that belief in God was um, rationally incoherent. So that there you was mean uh, contradictory or something like that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There was some intrinsic contradiction in some uh, – the belief in, in, in God as proposed by classical theism uh, results in some kind of contradiction. Right. Sure. No, I think that's right. I think, you know, if we mean strict falsification, meaning show it to literally be false and not true, you'd need something like that. For, for example, in the Summa Theologiae, the, the two arguments that Thomas gives against God, you know, one is that natu- natural causes are sufficient – to explain everything, so we we don't need to posit God. And the second one, of course, is the problem of evil. What I think some people don't realize is that the first one he lists that, uh, I, don't, I think it's the first, that natural causes are sufficient, that technically speaking wouldn't falsify God. Because even if natural causes are sufficient, that, that doesn't mean that a God doesn't still exist. It just means we wouldn't make, perhaps have any justification for arguing that. But the only one, I think you're right, Chris, that the only way to really falsify God is to show that there's something contradictory. Either contradictory in the notion, or if the problem of evil truly could not be resolved, then a good God could not exist because the, t- the two couldn't coexist. You know. But of course, I do think the problem of evil can be resolved, so I don't buy that. I, right. yeah. I, I do too. I think it's probably the strongest argument against the existence of God, um, and I'm actually involved in a dialogue with a, actually a high school student who's a, uh, a son of one of my coworkers who's you know, struggling with faith issues, and so um, I, uh, the problem of evil and the kinds of contradictions that result from it are specifically the kind of thing that we're trying to help him resolve right now. Right. Now, what about you, Jonathan? I, I know this is probably not something you think of a lot, but you know, sometimes it's good to uh, play devil's advocate and think of objections on the other side and try to answer them. So have you ever thought about in your life what it might take to either falsify or, or if you don't want to go that strong, seriously question God? We actually get uh, a little bit of this in my dialogue, if you remember, but I want to hear what you have to say. Right, and I think for me, the uh, I, I agree with Chris. If it was shown to be irrationally, uh, if it was going to be, if it was rationally incoherent to believe in the existence of a classical god, then my uh, belief in God would be shattered or at least very shaken. Um, if, for instance, we uh, started, if, if there was an argument that made it so that God couldn't be simple, um, as in He was somehow to, uh, composed of uh, parts, whether you know physical or metaphysical, um, and uh, and was subject to change, that I'd have a really hard time actually understanding that to be God, uh, because it to me seems to be such, uh, a, a thing that requires a cause of itself. Um, and so right. there's and right. it's also the problem with people, as, as Chris is saying. But uh, for me, um, on the side of faith, if it were shown to me that not not that St. Thomas's five ways or Aristotle's or Plato's uh, arguments for God's existence or anybody else. Um, was uh, were incoherent, or even um, that the notion of God in and of, its, of, in and of itself is uh, itself is incoherent. But if it was shown that Christianity overall is something that's demonstrably false, um, especially the resurrection of Christ and the teachings in the New Testament, I think that to me would be more likely a, an avenue towards atheism than the. Uh, uh, the Why not an avenue yeah. towards Judaism? Because obviously they don't believe Christ was, uh, you know, the anointed one. That's true. That's true. Um, or yeah, I mean that's very true. Uh, to go towards the um, uh, Jewish point of view, but my my issue it would be would be a possibility or, or going to be with Islam or some other revealed religion. Um, I think that if there is a God um, who is actually interested and cares for us, that the uh, it's, it's necessary for Him to reveal Himself uh, for us to come to know Him as He is um, and be able to uh, to access Him. And that's um, uh, but that right there is the the problem. So one, I believe in a revealed religion, but the bigger problem is that if we're if we're going to see God as our final end, which I believe we can know through reason. Um, we don't have him as our final end naturally, and so the only way that can happen is through um, a, a supernatural gift of grace. Um, and the only religion that you know teaches that or teaches a uh, means by which that grace is extended to mankind while still holding in balance the system of justice necessary for God to be well just uh, is Christianity, because of the offer uh, offering that Christ has uh, given to us on the cross. Um, and so for me, and, and uh, was completed in the resurrection um, and, and given to me in baptism. And so for me, if the, the whole, uh, whole 
arc of salvation history within, within Scripture if um, the act of redemption done by Christ uh, is shown to be false and without any uh, real compelling reason to think that either Judaism or Islam or any other revealed religion uh, can put forth a, uh, a, a, an argument or put forth a reason to think that God is at one and the same time perfectly just and perfectly merciful and has provided an avenue for me to come to know him and to participate in his, uh, his divine nature and to come to uh, eventually see him as he is as my final end, um, then I don't think I could rationally uh, adhere to a, 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 either of those systems. And um, the problem would be is if I fell back on a vague theism, I know that I would likely fall back into a, a deism and then continue to fall back to a practical atheism at the very least because I know that I'm lazy. I know that I'm falling into sin. <laughs> so wait, so you, so you, you think that deism plus laziness leads to uh, effective atheism? Well, practically, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I think you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody who's not like that. Well, you know what I think that's the case is that we're not... We're not disembodied spirits. We're not pure intellects. So that if uh, if you're living yeah, a you. life of of, um, of uh, irreligion, but trying to assert faith in God at the same time, uh, you're not developing the kind of habits that are going to foster the the practice of that. And I think it would be very easy to fall into a practical atheism at that point. No, I think Chris is absolutely right. You know, two contraries can't exist in the soul at the same time. So if you're not living a certain way, or or I should say, if you're living contrary to the way of God it's going to be very hard to maintain uh, your belief and relationship with him. So, um, yeah. But I think, oh, yeah, go ahead. I, say, I think it's, it's funny because um, uh, I was telling Jonathan this one time, and, I, and I'll tell this to my friends sometimes. I'm, uh, I'm sitting around at my desk, and I'm writing a lecture on metaphysics for my Philosophy of God course, or I'm writing a paper on metaphysics uh, for, for whatever reason, and I look up at the world around me, and it's so very different, in a sense, from the abstract metaphysical world that's going on inside my head. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I go, what, what the heck am I doing? And why don't I get a real job? <laughs> you know? So I think those kind of things can influence us, too, if we're not uh, in a consistent practice of the faith. Now, Chris, yeah, you're scaring me here. I hope you're not you talking about doing metaphysics in your head. That's the way of the idealist. Now, I know you're oh, only yeah, yeah, yeah. speaking no, imprecisely. No, no. <laughs> I'm mean, speaking very yeah. imprecisely. Because yeah, I know. I know. Is, is grounded in sense experience. But, but you get the idea of, of how different what we do in our, in our books and our papers is from our everyday interactions with the people around us and, and how unaware they are of what we're doing so that you kind of feel like this kind of I, – I, uh, I can kind of uh, – empathize with Hume, who starts to feel like kind of like this like intellectual monster that's standing outside when you're doing that philosophy. And no, I hear you, man. Too. I totally yeah. hear you. But, you know, it could be a lot worse, man. You could be like a literature professor and start looking oh, for no. like sexism and Marx and Moby Dick or, or something, or you know. gender theory. <laughs> yeah, right. Was uh, <laughs> Moby Dick, uh, you know, non-binary or something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so let me give you my answer, because uh, oh, yeah, I asked you what would falsify or serious, make you seriously question theism. So I, I, I agree with both of you that, obviously, if something could be somehow shown to be genuinely contradictory, that would be a problem. But putting myself into the second part of the question, which was what would cause me to seriously question um, the whole thing, if somehow someone could explain to me in a persuasive and thorough way, A, how things could exist without a necessary being, and B, how the order we find in the universe can adequately be explained without an intelligent cause. And they could explain away, this is now, I guess, C, uh, all my mystical experiences that I've had in life, and they could explain them away through natural causes. Then I would be like, wow, okay, I have to do some serious reflection here. But, I, I, but I'm fairly sure that that would be a tough thing to do. Now, I'm not saying that I wouldn't be open to hearing somebody try, but uh, I think that would be a tough order to fill. Yeah, it certainly would be a tough order not to, to do all of that. Um, I think that a, a good number of our atheist friends who may be listening may believe that they have uh, been able to do so um, or would be able to do so. So I encourage them to call in at 515-604-9344 with the access code of 914-121. One more time, that's 515-604-9344 with the access code of 914-121. Um, and, you know, as philosophers, you know, obviously that uh, all, all three of us are, Catholic, are, are theists, but we're the specifically a Catholic theist, and so we believe in um, you know, God the Father Almighty, the Trinity, Jesus Christ, uh, all, all the events uh, done and described in the Bible, um, and the, uh, the 
magisterium of the church, but as philosophers, we're, we're very open to the truth. And so if uh, you are willing to call in and speak with us, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, in dialogue with uh, individuals who are primarily uh, seeking after the truth rather than simply trying to uh, confirm their own worldview, which, you know, I, I, at the least I feel like I can attest to since I uh, actually converted to the Catholic faith after years of being raised in an anti-Catholic um, household. Um, uh, the, the truth is something I'm always uh, searching, uh, searching for, and I'm always happier when I find it. So if you think that we Thomas have somehow gone way off base in our arguments for God's existence as found in St. Thomas's uh, Summa Theologiae or Summa Contra Gentiles, we highly encourage you to call in at that number. You know, uh, Jonathan, I was thinking about, you know, what else could possibly cause a person to question their faith in God. And, you know, and that's if you accept some kind of epistemology, some kind of a theory of knowledge, whereby we can't really know the nature of the real world at all, like a Kantian theory of knowledge, that um, our minds are imposing our own structures of thought in the world rather than us knowing the world in and of itself. I think walking down that path could be a problem for someone as far as belief goes. Yeah, I, uh, I certainly think so too, and um, I've seen Actually, that. Yeah, Sorry, if I could just jump in real quick, I'm sorry. Um, in a way, Kant is one of the most ironic thinkers because, in his mind, he, he you know, he's in his life, he, he apparently was a devout, you know, pietist kind of Lutheran Christian, and uh, he was trying to protect religion. Right? He talks about making a space uh, for religion such that philosophy and science can't assail it, right? Because it's of the noumenal right. world or something like that, and science and philosophy can't talk about the noumenal world. But actually, what I think he did is he kind of put it in an isolated corner where everybody now forgets about it almost, if you will. Like, he, ironically, he had the opposite effect. I think he, instead of protecting it, I think he helped pave the way for it fading away. Absolutely. Because you, sub, you make it subjective in a sense uh, in that uh, you can't right. have an objective reason for believing. So if it's simply subjective, it goes away. It's just like a, a subjectivist ethics. Over time, a subjectivist ethics just mutates into uh, nihilism. Right. Yeah, and just for our listeners who aren't uh, up on um, early modern philosophy and uh, the uh, the epistemology of Immanuel Kant, um, a little bit of background. So uh, Hume, uh, David Hume famously uh, looked at the uh, notion of uh, causality and saw that there wasn't a direct correlation between the cause and effect, but rather we see two events happen. You see the you see the uh, a billiard ball run into another one, and you don't see the you don't see the cause, or you don't you don't see the uh, the causality that's happening within it. You don't see the principle of uh, causality that in either anywhere in that uh, whole series of events. Rather, you just see um, point uh, event A, the ball rolling, the cue ball, and then point B, or time B, the uh, black ball uh, being hit and going into the corner pocket. Um, and so he saw that there was a, a strong separation. And from that, uh, he more or less destroyed all arguments for God's existence, at least on his, his view. Uh, most, most arguments for God's existence, he uh, separated. He also basically destroyed science in a way, if you think yeah. about it. Once cause and effect Absolutely. is gone, what are you going to do in science? I, I don't know, make, make guesses? And so, and so he, he, he didn't say there, that nothing, <laughs> nothing causes, it would just be like, we see these things so often that we make an association, um, and so we expect them to happen. And um, in Kant, when he when he read this, he went into a long period of silence, and then came out a few years later and uh, wrote one of his great works, um, in which he uh, tried to uh, make make uh, the methods of empirical science uh, work again, um, and also leave room for theism, as Dr. Delfino was saying. And the way that he did it was uh, stupid but genius. Um, and <laughs> Insofar as he flipped, uh, he flipped the order of knowledge. And so, in the classical sense, we, uh, uh, as we look upon the world, we see what's out there, and our mind conforms to that reality. But rather, what Saint, or not Saint, <laughs> what Immanuel Kant says is that uh, the we, we get these sensible images from somewhere. This this, this chaotic sensible uh, uh, input that we get uh, is in our mind, and our mind. Uh, through his various categories, uh, impose a structure on it. And so we can say that we know through a priori means, which are always uh, always guaranteed, you know, an effect can't be greater than its cause is an a priori uh, uh, principle. Um, we, we know those things for sure because our, it starts with our mind. And so we know our own mind and we impose it upon the uh, sensible um, experiences that we have. Um, and he says that it's universal knowledge because all people are like this, which, you know, how he knew all people were like this and it wasn't just an imposition of his own mind is, you know, beyond me, but whatever. Um, Actually, can I chime in for a second? 
Yeah, go ahead. I, yeah. I'm not an expert in cons, so. No, no, no. I know you're, you're doing a, you're doing a great job. I, what I what I wanted to uh, say though is, cons. Uh, forgive me. I apologize to anybody listening to this uh, radio show who's a fan of Kant. I mean, I will admit his uh, his ethics is better than utilitarianism, but that's not saying much in my book. But in a way, Kant is a travesty. I mean, it's a train wreck. Uh, you know, he, by by making the mind, by making reality conform to the mind, or the mind construct reality. I mean, he opens basically is the grandfather of the postmodernists and all of this intense subjectivism mm-hmm. that you can construct reality and all this kind of stuff, which is just an absolute disaster. But even worse than that, for those of you listening to this, there's a contradiction. We talked about what would make us uh, perhaps uh, think that. God's existence has been falsified. We talked about contrad- uh, if, it was gen- if the notion of God was generally contradictory, that would be a serious problem. Well, Kant has a blazing on fire contradiction in his system of thought that he apparently wasn't even aware about. And Norris Clark talks about this, by the way. For example, you said that uh, you know, in Kant, we have this chaotic sensation data, and then the mind organizes it. How does he know that we have any uh, data from the senses, right? He says we can't see the noumenal world, right? We don't know it directly. And he says that cause and effect are actually in the mind and they're imposed. So you can't argue because yeah. I'm seeing stuff that something is causing it in me, something out there in the world. No, he can't do that either. So actually, there's no way in Kant's system of philosophy that he can know that there's a world outside of his mind. In fact, he might quite be dreaming the whole thing up. He might be the sole existent. So his philosophy right. leads to absurdities and madness, in my opinion. And, it's inner, and well, there's an inner contradiction to it. So it's just it's a train wreck. And then there's Wittgenstein's critique that to draw a, line, a fence between what we know and what we don't know and the way that Kant does requires that we end up thinking on both sides of the fences and that, you know, Kant's talking about it's the nature of the noumena not to be knowable seems to be predicating something of the noumena, something of the unknown world, in which case he's become a metaphysician when all he's trying to reject metaphysics. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Um, what can say in the way he words things? That was hilarious to me. Um, <laughs> But, uh, okay, so I'm just going to... Well, I'm not saying there Wittgenstein are, is okay, great. Okay, for, for, <laughs> all right, there, there are no is, official endorsements of Wittgenstein here, but he has a good yeah. point. <laughs> he has a few good points here and there. Exactly. <laughs> uh, what were we even talking about, man? God? Um, oh, oh, actually, I have a question again for both of you, if, if, right, unless, for unless you want to go, uh, Jonathan. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's okay, so don't worry about it. I'm pretty sure I can pick at least one of Chris's, but I want to know from both of you, of the five ways, which two are your favorites? Now, I know, I'm pretty sure Chris really likes the second way, but I don't know what his second favorite is. Uh, we don't actually kind of revise that over the past year. Um, oh, I okay. Think my favorite is, the, is, is actually the third way. Oh, that's uh, one of my favorites. Yeah, by far, I think the third way is my favorite. I actually particularly like the way that it is presented, not in the Summa uh, Theologiae, but in uh, yeah, it's contradictory. I think it's, it's, it's direct. It's a little bit easier to present it in that way. And, and I what, think what would be I, your second pick for uh, a fi- one of the five ways? Probably the fifth way. The fifth? Ooh. Okay. Uh, any other well, comments on those two, uh, Chris? Yeah. Um, uh, the fifth way, I think, is particularly interesting because it talks. It, it's an explanation for order in the universe but it's not an explanation for order in the universe that follows the design argument model from Pele, which Hume pretty, pretty powerfully devastated that argument. Um, but uh, Thomas Aquinas' fifth way avoids all of the pitfalls of Pele's argument from design. Hmm. So. I think so, um, and I think that maybe it'd be a good idea for, the, for us to uh, touch on how you argue about, about for those. No, wait, no, which two do you like, Jonathan, or what are your two favorites? Mine, uh, my first one is the fourth way. Um, oh, okay. not necessarily because it's the uh, easiest to explain. In fact, I think it's probably the most difficult of all, of all five ways, particularly the way it's presented in the Summa. Um, he has cognitive <laughs> arguments in several of his other works, like uh, um, the Compendium of Theology um, has a, a, an interesting version, and uh, which I think is better, the best one. But then you also have the, uh, um, in the prologue of the Gospel, John, he presents a similar argument. Um, but the, uh, the metaphysics, metaphysics behind that are, are just uh, in, incredible, and it helps you understand um, practically the whole system of St. Thomas is thought <laughs> in order to actually grasp what St. <laughs> Thomas is saying, and that's one of the difficulties of the fourth way. Um, although I do believe that there are ways that you can condense it enough to make it a, a persuasive argument for somebody who's in front of you. You have like maybe two, two or three minutes to speak with them on. Um, but otherwise, in terms of the, uh, um, in terms of its efficacy in, uh, in reaching others and its simplicity, I would have to say uh, 
most certainly the third way. And I go for the third way uh, because I, it's, I think, the most logically um, uh, airtight. Um, I like the way that St. Thomas kind of caters to the person who, who, who the atheist by saying, even if the world, even if the universe were infinitely old, if there was infinite time, um, that uh, uh, that um, things wouldn't exist now um, if there were no independent, no independent first, if there were no independent first cause uh, sustaining all things in existence. Um, I, I appreciate that because it's always good to kind of give your opponent a bone um, in order to prove them wrong. Uh, I've found it to be the most effective in the ministry setting. Uh, to, to speak about how we are uh, uh, right now dependent on other things for our existence and then uh, and, and, uh, kind of go on and continue to, uh, to lead people down that path that we, uh, that we are ultimately dependent upon um, this, uh, this uh, being which is altogether necessarily the thing itself, um, which is what we call God in, uh, in every, uh, practically every uh, understanding of God that we have. At the very least, he's something that exists in himself and isn't created by any other. Mm-hmm. Okay, now before I, I re- oh, oh, just one quick second, Chris. I'm sorry. Before I reveal um, the two that are my favorite, Chris, you you mentioned the third now, and you changed it from the second. So now I'm just kidding around with you, but are you slowly? Because if you usually second uh, way guys are more Aristotelian Thomas, but third way uh, guys are a little <laughs> more existentialist. Are you slowly uh, coming to the dark yeah, side? I'm like kidding. Well, <laughs> Actually, so I'll say this, um, and this is going to sound like I'm sucking up, but I'm not. Um, there were three professors I had in my graduate education who profoundly influenced the way I think about Thomas Aquinas. One was Timothy Smith, the other was Dr. Peter Redpass, and then the, other, the, third, the, the, the third one that I had at the end of my post-master certificate program would, uh, was, uh, was you, Dr. Delfino. And, oh, wow, um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Well, you, you know, a very clear teacher. And um, one of the things you did in that course when you uh, reviewed the third way, I'd always kind of bought the way the third way was presented, it always kind of bothered me quite a bit. And it seemed to suggest that, you know, over infinite time, every potential becomes actualized was a premise in the argument. And that really bothered me. Uh, because that seems false. And then I read your presentation of the third way, and you actually delved into what the Latin has to say about it, and that's not what the third way is arguing at all. And after I saw that, I said, wow, the third way is, is really powerful if, if you get rid of this false premise or this false interpretation of it. And uh, so there was that. And then as far as existentialism goes, I, you know, I, I feel like uh, – I, I definitely have um, one foot, and I've said this before, in the world of existential Thomism and one foot in the uh, world of Aristotelian Thomism. But, but certainly um, I've come to inter- uh, appreciate how uh, Father uh, Joseph Owens reads the five ways from his existential um, perspective. And, I, and, I, I, and the way you presented the third way, I actually really very much have come to appreciate that approach. My plan is working. I'm kidding. Uh, so, no, actually, uh, one of the reasons why I, I spend a lot of time on the third way and is because it happens to be probably my favorite of the five. Like, like Jonathan said, I, in a way, when, when one understands it clearly, it, it's fairly airtight in the sense that, you know, we're not talking about any ordinary features of reality. We're talking about why does anything exist? I mean, even for Descartes, it's really hard to deny that things exist. I mean, I know he says, I think, therefore, and, but that's, that's all you need is one thing to exist, you know. Um, so it's very hard for somebody to wake up in the morning and say, ah, I'm not sure if things exist. I mean, come on. It, it, you can't really do philosophy if you're going to have that kind of attitude. So it's a very powerful uh, argument. Now, the question is, what would be my next favorite? Now, if you would have asked me this a year ago, I clearly would have said, uh, before I wrote the book with Matt Fred, I would have said um, the fifth, because uh, although it's complicated and has problems, I do think um, explaining the order in nature that we find is, 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 is something that, you know, it, it's hard to explain away, so a powerful argument can be made. The problem with the fifth way I don't like is that, well, you have to massage it a lot and tweak it a lot because Aquinas didn't know about evolution, and certainly that's part of the story. So, you know, I push it back to the particles of physics, like why does the electron have a natural inclination to the proton to mm-hmm. form atoms and all that kind of stuff. But now after um, researching the fourth way a lot for this book, I have to say, now that I feel like I understand it more, I kind of like it too, although it's it's kind of abstract as well. So I don't know. It's my second favorite is either the fourth or the fifth, depending on the day. <laughs> well, and see, one of the uh, reasons why I like the fourth way too is that it it appeals to that mystical uh, side of man that desires to encounter something greater than oneself. Um, when you have 
uh, an argument for the first mover refers to necessarily existing as first cause of the universe or the first cause of existence. I mean, those are, those are great, and they can certainly lead somebody out of atheism. Um, but does it lead them to uh, a, a philosophical conversion of heart? Um, a, a, a real philosopher isn't somebody who simply is able to uh, pop off these uh, um, a abstract theories or, or, or arguments or um, give you uh, strong distinctions between being in essence or real cognitional being, those sorts of things, but rather a real philosopher is somebody who's, who seeks and is fulfilled by wisdom um, and somebody who is desiring this encounter, this uh, whole person trans and, and which leads to a whole person transformation uh, with being. And in the fourth way is because it so uh, strongly relies or because it uh, appeals to um, and, uh, and speaks of those transcendentals of goodness and truth and, and unity, um, those, those things which fulfill us in so many ways. I think that when somebody understands that the, uh, the very cause of our being is also the cause of all the goodness in our life, is also the very cause of all the truth that we encounter in the world that, that feeds our mind and allows us to uh, live a fully active and human life. And even beyond that, if you look even to the, uh, the, um, the side of the fourth way, which deals with uh, the uh, example of formal causality, if you understand that everything uh, participates in the nature of the first cause um, and resembles it insofar as it participates in it, uh, that a man who walks in the way of the Lord, um, the man who is virtuous and kind and, um, and, uh, and, and gentle, is somebody who better participates and better images uh, the God who is sustaining human existence than somebody who is absolutely uh, vicious. And that we have a particular place in creation that is above and beyond that of uh, any other animal, for sure, and then certainly, but certainly above every, um, and certainly above every every uh, material thing. Um, and so there's uh, this, this whole uh, personal encounter that you have uh, with the fourth way that places you um, not only as a, as a creature, um, but in relationship to this uh, this God who has uh, given you the goodness that you have and who you ought to strive to be like and your, your place in, this, in a very special um, orientation with God all of creation. And so that's one of the reasons why I love the fourth way. Um, <laughs> no, anyway. I think you made a lot of good points there. I think unfortunately for uh, probably a lot of modern um, you know, persons, um, yeah. especially in our culture in the West, one of the, I think the, one of the obstacles I think for the fourth way is that we, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people tend to think of what is good and what is true as somewhat subjective or relative and that sort of has to be overcome first before I think those, that way can be, uh, you know, rehabilitated. Now, Dr. Delfino, would you, be, uh, would you be so kind as to give a quick presentation or a quick summary of the fourth way so our listeners know what we're talking about here exactly? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, hmm. Well, let me see. Okay. I, uh, you know what? I, I'm going to read a little bit from the synopsis of... Uh, and, in the book I published with Matt Fred, we have um, Great idea. little synopses at the end of the book, and I kind of worked hard on them. So let me try reading one of these. They're not very long. and See how it goes. Okay. So, The Fourth Way, read by Robert Delfino, funded by... <laughs> okay. Um, he'll, pay, he'll get paid for this. It's page uh, 122, if you want to follow along. Um, Every being we encounter possesses goodness to some degree. This is true because of the following argument. Goodness is related to the level of perfection of a being. For the more perfect something is, the more we desire it. And the level of perfection of a being is measured according to the kinds of actions it performs, because perfection is related to actuality. The more actuality and the less potentiality a being has, the more powerful kinds of actions it can perform. Now, we know through observation that some kinds of being are better. They possess greater goodness than others. For example, plants are better than stones because plants are alive. And humans are better than plants because humans are alive and intelligent. To talk about an attribute such as goodness is indirectly to talk about being or existence because a thing has actuality only if it exists. Everything that exists, therefore, will have some level of actuality and therefore some level of perfection and therefore some level of goodness. In contrast, only some kinds of being possess life or intelligence. Therefore, everything we encounter possesses goodness in being to some degree. But we can only judge that different kinds of things have more or less being to the extent that they resemble or approach, in different ways, something which is maximal being. Now, the maximum in any genus is the cause of all in that genus when two conditions are true. One, 
when the things in that genus require a cause, and two, when it's impossible for the cause of the things in that genus to be outside of that genus. Condition two is true because it is impossible for a cause of things in the genus being to be outside of the genus being. For to be outside of the genus being is to be non-being or nothing, which cannot act as a cause. Condition one is true because of the following argument. If something's essence were identical to its existence, it would be pure existence and also pure actuality for existence is what makes something actual. Additionally, it would be totally perfect, because as explained above, the level of perfection is related to the level of actuality. But none of the beings we experience in life are totally perfect. This implies that something must be limiting their existence, namely their essence or nature. Plants, for example, cannot walk or reason because their nature limits what they can do. So when a thing only possesses being in a limited way, such as a plant does, it implies that the thing in question had the potential to receive being, but only to a degree. But something cannot actualize its own potential to receive being, for then it would cause its own existence, which is impossible. Therefore, a cause external to it must give it being. And it is for this reason that all things which possess being in a limited way require a cause. Therefore, there must be something which is to all limited beings the cause of their being, goodness, and every other perfection they have. Now, the cause of all these limited beings cannot itself possess being in a limited way. Otherwise, it too would require a cause. So the cause of the being of limited beings must be unlimited or maximal being. Now, if essence and existence are really distinct in a being, then existence must be compared to essence as actuality or potentiality. But in such a case, the essence as potentiality limits existence. But this cannot be true of maximal being, since it is not limited in any way. Therefore, existence is not distinct from essence, but rather is identical to it in maximal being. Thus, the maximal being must be pure existence or being itself. And this we call God. So that's the, uh, <laughs> maybe a little long-winded, but fourth way is, is, is it doesn't roll off the tongue easily. Uh, so I figured I'd give that a try reading it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it definitely doesn't. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I said earlier that you, it, uh, well, it may, uh, I, I like it because it has made me learn Thomas's metaphysics in order to understand it because you practically have to have an, uh, a comprehensive vision of what um, St. Thomas means uh, by practically every term that he uses in that. Uh, in that argument, um, which in the Summa, I, I don't even think it's, it's not even that long. It's what, maybe five sentences, five, six sentences. Um, and, and this is this be interesting enough to say. I, I, I don't think that St. Thomas is actually, in the, in the Summa, let me pull it up here real quick, is actually presenting the full argument. Um, I think he's giving us a, uh, a bit of a, a truncated statement. Hold on no, I think you're right about that, because I think the, yeah. the Summa was intended to be taught by a master teacher who would fill in some of the blanks, if you will. Yeah, he's kind of, you know, I'm throwing it up, but more or less predicated different things, according to the resemblance to the maximum, et cetera, et cetera. And then he goes on, and there's a lot of gaps that, that are going on there. But for, to me, it seems like he's just kind of giving me bullet points. You know, I, I do the same thing when I give a talk. I don't write down my entire transcript. I um, just <laughs> do a bullet point and jog my memory. Um, nothing against you, Dr. Delfino. I actually appreciate the transcripts. Um, but all I need is that little, little, little bullet point, a word or a sentence or something, a phrase, something to, to, to give my... Um, brain and oh yeah, wake up and this is the direction you need to go because otherwise my thoughts are all sorts of chaotic. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I think actually I do have a um, a different version of the fourth way. I think in in steps which I used in my uh, Holy Apostles course last year. If you want, I could track that down quickly and uh, read that. But otherwise, you guys can give your take on the uh, fourth way. Well, well um, I was I was uh, sorry, go ahead, Jonathan. Sorry. Oh, okay. Right, uh, right. So I was just going to say that you know. The fourth way has two parts, and, I, and it seems to me that because of the bullet point nature of the way it's presented, um, non-believers, or, or, or those who object at least to the validity of the fourth way, tend to present it uh, very inaccurately, uh, you know, misunderstanding the point that the first, the first part of the argument is to show that there's some maximum, um, and that the second part of the argument is to show that the maximum is God, um, and that this only works with certain things like the concepts covered in the fourth way. So, for example... Uh, Thomas is talking about um, truth and goodness, which in his mind or in his, in his uh, metaphysical uh, outlook of the world, truth and goodness are synonymous with being. 
so that if you find degrees of truth and goodness, you find degrees of being. But then you get, um, you know, uh, critics of the fourth way will come in and say, well, you know, if, if everything that has uh, admits of degrees must, you know, have a maximum, um, then there must be a degree, there must be a maximum ugliness, which is the unlimited cause of all ugliness in the world. And, and that fails to get the point entirely. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a problem in understanding it. And I don't know that we have time to solve that problem here, but my point is, is if you want to read Thomas's five ways, it's not enough to just sit in the Summa Theologiae and read them. You also need to get some background knowledge to understand uh, what, what's filling in what's missing in those bullet points. Actually, I found my little eight-step version of the fourth way. If you want me to read it, I can do that. It's much shorter, or we can move on. All right. That'd be fantastic. So this is how I presented it last summer, actually, for the Holy Apostles course, although I I, I subsequently uh, obviously dove in more for for the book with some more research. But I think this is actually a little simpler, shorter, and hopefully more understandable. So everything we encounter in step one, everything we encounter in life possesses intelligibility or truth and goodness to some degree. Step two. In the case of goodness, we know this because some things are better than others. For example, a ladybug is better than a stone because it's alive, and a human is better than a ladybug because it's alive and intelligent. Step three, to talk about attributes such as intelligibility and goodness is to indirectly talk about being because uh, intelligibility and goodness are aspects of being. Step four, we know this because goodness, for example, is not restricted restricted to a particular genus or species. Instead, anything that has being possesses goodness to some degree. In contrast, only some kinds of being possess life or intelligence. Step five. Therefore, everything we encounter in life possesses being to some degree. Step six. But more and less are predicated of different things to the extent that they resemble in their different ways something which is the degree of most, the maximum, which we call the exemplar cause. Step seven, the exemplar cause must exist, otherwise multiple things could not share more or less of the same attribute. Step eight, this is because to possess goodness, for example, only to a degree, more or less, is for something to possess that attribute through a cause. For if something possessed goodness through its very nature, then its possession would not be limited or imperfect. Conclusion, there must be a totally perfect being, which is to all these limited and imperfect beings, the cause of their having in different degrees, being goodness, intelligibility, and every other perfection they have as beings. And this we call God. All right, that is certainly much shorter. Um, and uh, let's see here, we got time for Okay, so one of the, one of the principal objections that uh, people come to, against the fourth way with is the idea of goodness as being a subjective judgment rather than an ontological uh, reality that we discover that's, that's truly inherent in things. Um, and... Uh, with respect to that, you know, how, how is it, Dr. Delfino, or, or, or Chris, if you want to answer this too, but Dr. Delfino is our resident expert, um, how is it that we make that, help, help somebody make that move from thinking that uh, goodness is merely a subjective opinion um, to the realization that goodness has a, a reality in things? Well, in the book, uh, you know, AJ uh, kind of counters uh, Lucy on these points. Um, for example... One of the important things you have to realize is we're talking about kinds of being. We're not talking about individuals. So there's a scene in the book where uh, uh, Lucy asks AJ, who's the uh, agnostic of the atheist, like, well, what's better? Is it better to be a man or a tree? Now, obviously, most of us would say it's better to be a man because human beings are intelligent, trees are not, so I would rather not be a tree. But he says, well, I would rather be a tree than be Adolf Hitler, who is obviously very evil. Uh, and, and so, you know, she smiles and, and she says, yeah, but that, we're not talking about individuals here. We're talking about kinds. Obviously, uh, as a kind, a tree is more limited than a man. Trees can't walk around. They're rooted in the ground. They don't have intelligence, right? So nobody really wants to be a tree. If they can avoid it, they'd much rather be a human being. So I, I guess you have to stress the fact that we're talking about kinds of being, not individuals. And then I think we have a much better chance with the average person talking about what's good than the true, because I hate to say it, modern education has almost totally relativized and gotten rid of and made into a bad word, truth. Yes. That's, That's interesting, because uh, for me, and I'm not, this is not to contract Dr. Fino, for me, I feel a, a more at ease myself explaining it from the truth perspective, because for Thomas, when he's talking about this ontological truth, he's talking about uh, the intelligibility, the intelligible content of a being's nature, and as you go up the degrees of being, for example, um, uh, you know, the essence of a, of a non-living being has some intelligent con- intelligible or knowable content. 
But the essence of a living being has all of the intelligible content of the non-living type of being plus the intelligible content that goes with being a living being. And then a human being has all of that plus the intelligibility of being rational. So you see as you go up the degrees of being, you're, al- you're adding more and more intelligible content. And, and I, for me, at least, that's, that's easier for me to, to, at least from my perspective, to explain to somebody. Right. And I actually agree, and, um, and I'll approach that the same, in the same way, but from the goodness perspective. I, I typically go with truth because, like Chris, that's a little bit more, um, speaking of intelligibility, uh, which is what I think Thomas means by, by truth in this sense, um, in the fourth way. Uh, yeah, I think that goes the same with goodness, is that goodness isn't the judgment made by the observer necessarily um, in terms of uh, I'm imposing my own vision of what just goodness is, but rather looking at the being. You know, yeah, a, a, a rock, the good, the good for a rock is to be heavy and hard. And you know, so long as the rock is doing that, it's good for that rock to be that rock. Because the, the, the fulfillment of uh, the, what the thing is is uh, going to be in accordance with its form. Um, similarly, you, you bump it up to a tree, um, which has all you know, the, the material uh, constituents. It's, it's, it's atomic. It has uh, matter and all that jazz that the rock has. <laughs> and it has so much more. It has life. Um, not the same kind, mind you. But, uh, but so the, the good for the tree is to do tree things well. Um, but there's still only a limited amount of, of being that's expressing. There's only so much that's going on within that tree um, that's good for that tree. And what's good for a human isn't, or what's good for a rock isn't good for a tree because you need to water a tree and keep it in the sun, but a rock doesn't care if it's dark or sunny out. Um, and then similarly, you bring up to a, a, you know, the level of a cat. Um, you know, a cat has uh, the sensitive life, and it's great that a cat has that sensitive life. And it's, um, there's more good that, is, uh, that fulfills its being because it now can encounter reality and react to it um, and... Uh, and, and make decisions based on its, uh, what it perceives with its senses and um, it feels, uh, feels stuff and has a social nature and all that jazz. So there's, there's more interaction and more expression of um, uh, the act of existence within the cat than there is a tree. Um, and you uh, continue going up to, to man who eventually uh, is able to encounter being itself um, through uh, their, our rational uh, faculty or uh, the act of intellect. Um, and so the, the greater a thing is, the more uh, the greater the good, the final end of uh, a thing, or the, the, the greater the final uh, end or the uh, perfection of a thing um, is um, at the same level of its uh, uh, expression of the act of existence um, through, through its essence. So a man is greater than a cat because it, we, uh, we not only have all of the uh, physical um, realities of you know, being a material being, and all the sensitive realities of being an animal, but we also have that ability to come to know truth in itself and come to know goodness and beauty uh, and recognize the, the nature of things. So well, let me just say one quick thing. I'm glad that both of you guys have had um, some good success relaying the fourth way in your own ways uh, to others, but with respect to the truth way, I mean, it's great if Chris can do it that way. That's awesome. But I have to tell you, I, I never thought I would encounter so much problems with the notion of truth but i was speaking to some professors i know and they would not admit the notion of objective truth i even had to say to one of these professors but you have a son isn't that objectively true and she did not want to go there she just looked at me and and i'm like i don't know what to do with that i mean if you don't know you have a son i mean at one point over beer it got to the point where she had to get up to go to the restroom i'm like you know peeing is a universal truth and i got another (laughs) i got i got another smirk and it's like yeah i mean i don't know what to do but sounds like you guys are having more success than I am, so I must be doing something wrong. <laughs> well, that's because well, you, you know what I feel like. Academics. Is, well, you know, and also on, on a side from that, I feel like younger younger generations are hitting this point now, where they're starting to get fed up with postmodernism and radical subjectivism. Amen. They're starting to see it as nonsense. <laughs> they're starting to see it as nonsense, and I think a lot of it is they look at how postmodernism and radical subjectivism leads to the insanity of contemporary gender theory and transgender stuff, and how that if you don't, you know, in some countries, if you don't refer to a man as a woman, you're going to get prosecuted. And they've just had it. They've had it with that nonsense. And, uh, you know, uh, whether or not they're believers or not, the, uh, the, the, I, I see, and I especially see this even among non-believers and atheists, uh, that the postmodernist movement is dying. If, well, if, that would be a like, blessed event if it's true. Yeah, well, at least on a popular level, it's dying because people just don't want to put up with it, you know, anymore. Right, right, right. Well, unfortunately, it's flourishing in the uh, crazy lands of academia still. But maybe, maybe it'll have it. Maybe it'll eventually fall down in another few decades. Who knows? Although universities might fall down, you know, this whole online teaching thing might take that over too. Who knows? 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> and also the things that people are, uh, I've had some professors criticize me you know, as I'm seeking a job in uh, academia, criticize me for going to an online school, but I'm thinking, dude, in like five years, this is going to be the thing. This is going to be uh, a, a, an asset to my, my uh, curriculum vitae is that I have so much experience with online teaching because that's what so many people are going to do because it's affordability, it's like that uh, accessibility and all that jazz. Um, but gentlemen, um, we can remain online after the, the show is up here, but we are coming to the end. Uh, and unfortunately, we get, didn't get to Studi's story corner with my uh, wonderful train conducting tale of <laughs> harrowing Dr. Robert and horror, um, which you guys can listen to <laughs> in a couple of weeks. You will learn that it was certainly worth your time. But anyway, for uh, WK Radio and Lost Voice and my absent co-host, Jacob Nelson, um, not to mention our present co-host, uh, Christopher Apodaca, and our guest, while well, there's a lot of people that are mentioning, um, uh, Dr. Robert Anthony Alfino, uh, Delfino, uh, God bless. Uh, check out his book on Amazon, uh, Does God Exist? A Socratic Dialogue. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.